Hello, my name is Kristen Ann Ehrenberger, and I'm going to talk to you about poliomyelitis vaccination, a Pittsburgh success story. For those of you who would like to have an audio description of my appearance, I am a middle-aged white woman with brown hair that is pulled back in two French braided pigtails. I am wearing dark blue glasses and a gray turtleneck sweater with a silver chain. I am presenting against a brown background. On my title slide, you can see a tricolor rendering of the poliomyelitis virus and a syringe. Let's begin. Opinionated tweets abound, such as this one from a vet d'entremont, AKA science babe. During the spike in COVID-19 cases in the winter of 2020, she wrote, it's more accurate to compare this to polio. That had a higher percentage of asymptomatic cases, thought to be 70 to 95%. And at most, 1% of cases were paralytic. Only about 5% of paralytic cases were fatal, so 0.05%. We made a big deal about that, didn't we? Although the last case of wild type paralytic poliomyelitis acquired in the United States had happened in 1979, four years before Dantremont was born, here she calls upon the collective memory of both the fear that polio had aroused as well as the motivation to conquer the disease through public health science, namely vaccination. What were Americans afraid of? Poliomyelitis by itself is an ancient disease, but in its epidemic form, it was quite young. The first major documented outbreak in the United States occurred in Vermont in the summer of 1894. It took 10 years for scientists to establish its contagiousness. And actually babies were much less affected than polio by polio than children were. In fact, in 1916, an epidemic of infantile paralysis spread, infecting an estimated 25,000 people, killing around 5,000 in the United States and infecting 6,000 and killing 2,000 in New York City alone. This is a graph of cases from that epidemic. The hygiene hypothesis explains why epidemic polio developed in the late 19th century and why paralytic polio became a middle-class disease in the first half of the 20th century. For most of human history, almost everyone experienced a milder infection when they were younger and still relatively protected by maternal antibodies. After germ theory and rising standards of living, children growing up with enclosed indoor plumbing were more likely to catch symptomatic and potentially severe polio when they were older. This becomes important for both the optics of the disease and the problem of its solution. If we couldn't wash our hands or clean our way out of an annual scourge, what could we do? Here's another tweet that has circulated recently. Economist and former United States Secretary of Labor, Robert Reich wrote, quote, I'm old enough to remember when polio ripped through the globe and put my six-year-old friends into iron lungs. We dutifully lined up at school to get polio shots without the howling of governors or anti-vaxxers. And we eradicated polio. Why has saving lives become political?" End quote. This simplified and compressed chronology, while suitable for a 240 character microblog, belies the fact that science and medicine are always already political from the research questions we ask to the way we fund how we answer them. COVID is politicized in an environment of bipartisan bickering. 
fringe conspiracy theories and widespread enough distrust of mainstream science that I have wondered about the death of expertise. It's not that poliomyelitis wasn't politicized, just that the contexts were different. Reich then replied to himself, quote, for more than 60 years, we've required children to be vaccinated against dread diseases when they come to school. Why should COVID be any different? To which user JTOC retorted, quote, sure, the COVID mRNA vaccines work and save lives, but I'm also old, old enough to remember the polio vaccine never causing myocarditis in one in 20,000. The polio vaccine also actually stopped you from, you know, actually getting polio. About that. First, myocarditis is six times more likely after COVID infection than vaccination. And put a pin in the idea of not getting polio from the vaccine. Let's take a look at some of those earlier contexts. But first, a priming question. True or false? The flu vaccine was created before the first successful polio vaccine. Well, the answer is true, and it foreshadows some of the later content of this lecture. Bonus points if you know who or why. In the 20th century, the model for polio vaccination and then eradication was smallpox. What I want you to get from this slide is that the idea of vaccination was not new in the mid 20th century. There were about a dozen successful vaccines or passive immunizations already in use by the time Jonas Salk announced his polio vaccine. In fact, Salk had significantly contributed to the development of the bivalent flu shot in 1945 already. This chart also includes passive immunization with diphtheria antitoxin and gamma globulin for polio. Here at the University of Pittsburgh, William M. Hammond completed a double-blind placebo-controlled study that found that pooled antibodies were effective against poliomyelitis, but uneconomical on a national, never mind international scale. Just as antibiotic resistance is as old as antibiotics, so vaccine hesitancy is as old as vaccines. Smallpox is the classic example. You may have seen this satirical drawing from 1802, making fun of the effects of variolation. A detail I had not noticed before is that the painting on the wall is of the Old Testament Bible story of the ancient Hebrews worshiping the golden calf. When does a superstitious golden calf become a scientific gold standard. They had good reason to be suspicious. England, the birthplace of cowpox vaccination, was also the birthplace of vaccine hesitancy. When that cartoon I showed you was published at the beginning of the 19th century, smallpox was killing an estimated 400,000 people per year around the globe. But by the end of the 19th century, thanks to vaccination with cowpox and then virulation with an attenuated version of smallpox, there were far fewer deaths. And so the calculation between the risk of illness or even death with the vaccine versus the benefit of not catching the full-blown smallpox had changed. Thus, the law requiring smallpox vaccination was amended to allow for conscientious objectors, which is where we get that term. It's not actually from military history. So you can see there are a number of different disasters that happened. For instance, the Dallas disaster when five children died from a contaminated batch of diphtheria toxin antitoxin is when thimerosal first started to be used in multi-use vials to reduce bacterial contamination and thus 
further um, incidents. So a number of vaccines were available before the ones for polio, and most people would take them. For example, these lines at Morrisiana Hospital in the Bronx on April 14, 1947, represent a fraction of the 6.3 million New Yorkers who answered an appeal to get vaccinated after public health officials announced that a traveler from Mexico had come down with the disease. At that time, there was more trust of government than today. Today, in the post-Watergate, post-Vietnam, post-civil, and women's rights eras. On the heels of a successful collaborative world war effort, the second one in as many generations, there was also more faith in the ability of science and medicine to conquer feared diseases, as physicists had conquered the atom. In the end, there were 12 infections and two deaths in the city. And it is impossible to say how many lives were saved from a disease that had not been widely endemic since the early 1900s. The last cases of smallpox in the United States would be registered just two years later in 1949. For those who were not willing to volunteer, there were in fact vaccine mandates written with smallpox in mind. In the 1905 case of Jacobson v. Massachusetts, the question finally came before the United States Supreme Court, and the justices ruled that states had the right to make vaccination mandatory during an outbreak or impose a fine, which is the law that the Supreme Court has used thus far to strike down requests to put on hold vaccine mandates in Maine and New York State that do not have a religious exemption. Those cases are still working their way through the courts, but the Supreme Court has said we will not prematurely strike down those laws before the full cases have been heard because of the precedent sent to, uh, established by this uh, case, Jacobson v. Massachusetts. And then in 1922, the Supreme Court upheld a city ordinance that prohibited anyone from attending a public or private school without a certificate of smallpox vaccination under the justification that all powers not assigned to the federal government by the constitution were retained by the states and that sovereign states had the right to grant cities broad regulatory powers for the good of inhabitants. In the early 20th century, almost all health was local as the federal government at that time had a small but growing role in personal and public welfare. This is the statute under which people who oppose a federal COVID vaccine mandate are appealing to the Supreme Court that that is a right that is retained by the states rather than one that may be exercised by the federal government. On the other hand, the precedent that this sets that states may be allowed to require their children to be vaccinated will certainly come up when just this week, the Pennsylvania State Senate passed a law forbidding a requirement for COVID-19 vaccination in schools. The House has yet to take up the matter. Pivoting now from smallpox to poliomyelitis, in Vienna in 1907, Karl Landsteiner and Irvin Popper identified the cause of infantile paralysis as an infectious particle smaller than a bacterium that could not be filtered out of a solution prepared from a patient's spinal cord fluid. This means that the cause of polio was identified earlier than the cause of influenza. In New York City in 1909, Simon Flexner and Paul Lewis announced that polio was transmitted via the respiratory route. Unfortunately, they thought that because they were working with rhesus monkeys, which cannot contract polio via the true fecal oral route. When an early monovalent polio vaccine only protected against 
some cases of paralysis in Australia, Jean McNamara and Frank Burnett proposed the idea of multiple strands of poliovirus. Almost 20 years later, Isabel Morgan and David Bodian in Baltimore identified the three types of poliovirus that we know today. Part of the early work of the Salk Laboratory here at Pitt was to confirm their findings. Dorothy Horstman, Joseph Melnick, and Albert Sabin had verified in New Haven and Cincinnati in the 1940s that poliovirus could be found in the bloodstream, thus completing the chain of infection from mouth to gut to bloodstream to central nervous system. Finally, Rosalind Franklin led the team at the University of London that unraveled the virus's icosahedral structure in the 1950s. And two separate teams in Cambridge and on Long Island published this picornavirus's RNA genome in the early 1980s. So polio wasn't just a Pittsburgh success story. The first unmodified polio vaccine tests were done in monkeys already in 1910. By 1918, two New York researchers had immunized monkeys with a heat killed by a vaccine. But the first human trials that we know of did not come until 1935. John Colmer attenuated live polio virus with sodium ricinolate, tested a vaccine on himself and an assistant, and then on his sons, and finally on 10,725 children, of whom five died and 10 more were paralyzed. Problems may have been caused by production impurities, including monkey spinal cord antigens causing serum sickness. Unfortunately, the disastrous results of Colmer's trial overshadowed Maurice Brody's good but not quite significant results of 75% immunity with a formaldehyde killed injectable vaccine in 7,000 test subjects and 4,500 controls. Five children did contract polio before they were fully immune, but none died. And more than 10 years later, Isabel Morgan's chimpanzee trials proved that a killed virus vaccine could work but she left Johns Hopkins University to marry and care for her disabled stepson. She also remained hesitant about testing a vaccine in children using virus grown in neural tissue. Now, early in the COVID-19 pandemic, Canadian author Margaret Atwood described growing up in quarantine land, a childhood dystopia of shuttered schools and public pools due to a mysterious illness that struck with frightening regularity in late summer and early fall, but dealt its crippling effects randomly in communities and even within families. Indeed, 1952 was the peak year for polio in US history with 3,145 deaths and fully 37% of the more than 57,000 reported cases of polio, leaving the person with some kind of paralysis. That's over 21,000 individuals paralyzed. It's a lot bigger percentage than the 1% we learned in microbiology, but asymptomatic or even mildly symptomatic cases were not necessarily reported. Here are some immediate demographic and economic contexts to so polio vaccine development. On the left, the post-World War II baby boom, and on the right, paltry National Institutes of Health funding. That didn't even cross the $1 million mark until 1943 and had to be shared between all the projects of the now defunct National Center for Research Resources and the National Cancer Institute. If funding for infectious disease research didn't come from the NIH, then from where? If not from the government, then from the private sector. Franklin Delano Roosevelt had contracted a paralytic illness in 1921 at the age of 39. 
although assumed to be poliomyelitis at the time, some people now think it may have been Guillain-Barre syndrome. When he was elected governor of New York in 1928, he asked his law partner, Basil O'Connor, to take over fundraising for the whites only spa at Warm Springs, Georgia. FDR was elected to the first of four presidential terms in 1932. In 1934, O'Connor started throwing birthday balls to raise money for polio research. And in 1938, Roosevelt and O'Connor formed the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis. Singer Eddie Cantor suggested on the radio that people send dimes to the White House to help the cause. And within a few weeks, people had mailed 2,680,000 dimes to the uh, White House. And thus the March of Dimes was born. Under O'Connor's forceful, able, and imaginative administration, the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis established local chapters for volunteers to do grassroots funding, and also held flashy media spectacles with celebrities to raise tens of millions of dollars to support both patients and researchers. In 1946, FDR's profile was put on the US 10 cent piece. NFIP formally changed its name to March of Dimes in 1979. So here's another question. Who received the Nobel Prize for Research on poliomyelitis? The 1954 Nobel Prize for Physiology or Medicine was awarded to Harvard researchers John Enders, Thomas Weller, and Frederick Robbins just two years after their work was published. It was for successfully culturing the polio virus in isolated non-nerve tissue using penicillin to reduce bacterial contamination and without needing whole chick embryos. So the only Nobel Prize awarded for polio research was given before a successful vaccine had been announced. The choice of non-neural tissue solved many of the problems associated with earlier vaccines. But Enders was not interested in pursuing one. He thought that was more appropriate for industry, whereas his was an academic basic research lab. Plus, he and Alfred Sabin, among others, felt that only a live attenuated virus would generate sufficient immunity. However, he shared viral cultures and tips with the man who led the charge for a killed vaccine. The son of Jewish immigrants, Jonas Salk, went to medical school at New York University, but he had big dreams of serving large numbers of people through research rather than through clinical practice. After helping Thomas Francis invent an inactivated influenza A and B vaccine at the University of Michigan, he moved to Pittsburgh to run his own lab on polio, thanks to the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis funding. Using polio virus from Enders' lab and from the patients in the municipal hospital upstairs, Salk and his lab mates developed a method of cultivating polio in monkey kidney tissue. The virus was then killed by exposure to formaldehyde. He had a variety of vaccines ready to test on human subjects by 1952. The first human tests of Salk's killed injected polio vaccines were done on children with disabilities. While on the face of it, that sounds really unethical, and there are rarely defenses of questionable research practices in the era before widespread IRBs and a modern concept of consent. In this case, the equivalent of phase two safety trials were conducted in Sewickley at the Watson Institute on children who were recuperating there from severe polio. After Salk demonstrated not just safety, but the production of new antibodies, other residents and staff were injected. He followed those subjects for those all 98 of them for 10 years. 
Less defensible were the tests on 63 residents at the Polk State School and Hospital who had intellectual disabilities. The 1950s saw the height of overcrowding at Polk with almost 3,500 inhabitants on a campus built for 2,000. It is unclear whether all of the subjects in both of these trials had full parental consent to participate. In March of 1953, Salk injected himself, his wife, and their three sons. This is a famous promotional photograph of nine-year-old Peter Salk. And then they moved on to 5,000 Pittsburgh school children. And finally, in April 1954, the Vaccine Advisory Committee approved a national placebo-controlled double-blinded field trial with three arms, those getting the vaccine, those getting a placebo, and a small arm who received neither injection but were observed. Salk didn't want to have a placebo arm because he was so confident in the vaccine, but he was advised that the evidence for both safety and efficacy would be stronger with one. He was also overruled when it came to the last minute addition of thimerosal, aka merthiolate, aka monkey blood, as a preservative. It was commonly used not only in vaccines, but also as a home remedy for cuts and scrapes. He objected that his laboratory and early clinical trials hadn't included this ingredient, but it was an accepted part of vaccines and was included in the shots given to 1.8 million polio pioneers in 44 states. You have probably heard how parents flocked to have their children vaccinated against polio. And that is largely true but we're not actually to that part of the story yet. When I found Thomas Francis's paper on the trial methodology, I was surprised to learn that the commonly cited 1.8 million figure actually reflects the total number of first through third graders in the study areas, not the number who actively participated. If the study consent form was not returned, or if it was returned unsigned, then those 800,000 uh, children were not enrolled in the study. Participation was opt-in, not opt-out, and almost 40% of potential study population was not enrolled. So what accounted for differential enrollment? I was rewarded for slogging through Thomas Francis's trial methodology in which he reports that in some respects, they were basically making it up as they went along. And also that it was as difficult to get physicians to fill out paperwork in 1954 as it is in 2021. When towards the end, he brings up the truism at the time that children of lower socioeconomic groups typically contracted poliomyelitis at a younger age than children or youth of higher socioeconomic groups. So they did a sociological study, and these are the characteristics they found to be significant at the 99% level of confidence. One, the frequency of vaccination against smallpox, diphtheria, and whooping cough strongly correlated with participation. Two, participants were more frequently, more frequently stated that shots always work than non-participants. Three, mothers of participants were more likely to spend two or more evenings a week in outside activities than were mothers of non-participants. Four, mothers of participants were more likely to have completed high school than mothers of non-participants. Five, participation rate increased steadily with increasing income. And six, participants lived in better neighborhoods, and interviewers reported that their homes were better kept. That's a pretty hefty dose of classism right there. Another reason that there was vaccine hesitancy around parents and this as yet unproven shot may have been public naysayers. Shortly before the field trial started, 
yellow journalist Walter Winchell announced on the radio, good evening, Mr. and Mrs. America. In a few moments, I will report on a new polio vaccine claimed to be a polio cure. It may be a killer. He turned the fact that viral particles were found during safety checks into a dire warning that may have kept 150,000 children out of the study, even though he had no indication whether those viral particles were even infectious. Finally, exactly 10 years after Franklin Delano Roosevelt's death from a stroke, Salk's polio vaccine was declared to be safe, effective, and potent. It was 60 to 80% effective against paralytic polio in the observation arm, and 80 to 90% effective compared to the placebo arm. Unlike with Colmer and Brody's vaccines, no polio deaths were recorded in the active arm and only a few allergic reactions. The federal government licensed a vaccine later that day after just 2.5 hours of discussion. I say a vaccine because it was not actually the same one produced for the field trials. Salk had tweaked the formula yet again, and it actually did not have the merthiolate in it. You've probably heard what Dr. Salk told Edward R. Murrow on the CBS television show, See It Now, that very night. Quote, who owns the patent on this vaccine? Well, the people, I would say. There is no patent. Could you patent the sun? End quote. His face and his name were everywhere, and you can see that the adulation was genuine. In 1957, the University of Pittsburgh purchased the old municipal hospital and renamed it Salt Hall. It now houses the School of Pharmacy and the School of Dental Medicine. However, it is also true that Basil O'Connor encouraged Salk to be the face and voice of what was a team effort of other scientists, assistants, and technicians, among them Julius Youngner, Ethel Bailey, James Lewis, Rudolph Riley, Val Basley, Elsie Ward, Frank Buschek, and Byron Bennett. Salk's vaccine was the people's vaccine insofar as it was essentially crowdfunded through the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis. Private pharmaceutical companies Eli Lilly and Park Davis provided the vaccine for the field trials. These six pharmaceutical companies were allowed to produce vaccine in anticipation of approval. And the situation looked promising after the big announcement. That is until the Cutter incident. Just two weeks later, on April 25th, 1955, the jubilation came to a screeching halt with reports of healthy children sickened by their vaccinations. A clue? Paralysis in the limb, usually the arm, in which the vaccine had been injected. When live virus was found in some of their lots, Cutter Laboratories pulled their vaccine from the West Coast immediately. And two weeks after that, on May 8, 1955, the U.S. Surgeon General Leonard Scheel suspended all polio vaccination. In the Northeast, some children vaccinated with batches from Wyeth Laboratory also came down with abortive polio, but no live virus was ever found. And this may remind you of the brief halt to Johnson & Johnson COVID vaccination to study the rates of venous thromboembolism. While Salk was able to successfully kill the virus in small batches in his research lab, his process was difficult to scale up for the production of millions of doses. Cutter had replaced Salk's asbestos filter with a glass one so that they could more easily produce larger amounts of vaccine. This allowed bits of cellular debris to get through. Any viral particles adherent on the debris were relatively shielded from the formaldehyde intended to kill them. 
This seemed to prove Salk's detractors correct, who had warned that he was playing with fire by choosing to use the virulent Mahoney strain of type 1 poliomyelitis for his vaccine. You want politics? Polio vaccination had politics. The Cutter incident interrupted the debate, then ongoing, about how to distribute the vaccine. Inaugural Secretary of the United States Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, Ovida Culp Hobby, appeared at a noisy session of the Senate Labor and Public Welfare Committee in mid-June 1955. Republicans accused the Democrats of trying to make a political football of the polio vaccination program. Democrats replied that the administration was foisting the evil of a means test on children before they could get the new vaccine. Hobby worried that if she acquiesced to the federal purchase and distribution of the vaccine, the matter would still be in committee six months after the next polio season. She preferred a private market solution. The Democrats were then in power. The party was an unstable amalgam of FDR style progressives, the black voters who had changed allegiances after the New Deal in the 1930s, and conservative white Southern Dixiecrats, who from the late 1940s into the 1960s flirted with making the big switch to the Republican party in the name of states' rights and racial segregation. Hobby herself had switched from Democrat to Republican because she thought the New Deal was government overreach. When Republican Senator Barry Goldwater of Arizona asked Secretary Hobby whether providing free polio vaccines would create future expectations of the federal government to contribute to other public health campaigns, she replied, I'm sure there would be a demand for it. He asked, is there any other term for that than socialized medicine? Choosing her words carefully, she answered, quote, that's socialized medicine by the back door, not the front door, end quote. In the end, the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis, aka the March of Dimes, paid for a three-shot series of polio vaccination for the nation's first and second graders, and the federal government provided the states with funds towards purchasing vaccine to be given for free in mass clinics. Some states also bought vaccine and distributed it to family doctors for needy children. Vaccine was in short supply, especially since Cutter was out of the picture, and many parents were now eager to have their children protected. There are reports of wealthy people paying doctors for shots for their children and of others encouraging their kids to lie about their ages to cut in line when the vaccine was only being offered to children ages five through nine. The Cutter incident had repercussions. There were a number of resignations, among them William Sebrell, director of the National Institutes of Health, and at least indirectly, Secretary Hobby. The Surgeon General and the National Institutes of Health conducted an investigation that found that Cutter was not at fault, but a congressional hearing later in 1955 determined that more federal oversight of vaccine manufacturing was needed from the NIH Laboratory of Biological Controls. There were lawsuits. Gott Stenker v. Cutter Laboratories in 1958 found no negligence since Cutter acted in good faith, but it did establish the precedent of manufacturer liability without fault if an implied warranty, in this case for safety, was breached. Pediatric vaccinologist Paul Offit explained in 2005, quote, initially vaccines were unaffected by the Gott Stenker verdict. But in the early 1980s, lawyers in the United States successfully sued vaccine manufacturers, claiming that the pertussis vaccine caused permanent harm, despite a series of studies whose results were at variance with such claims. In 
to raise enough money to pay for increased liability insurance, the companies hiked the price of diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis vaccines from 17 cents per dose to $11 per dose. And the number of companies that made the vaccine dropped from eight to one. In 1986, to ensure the continued participation of pharmaceutical companies in the manufacture of vaccines, the National Vaccine Injury Compensation Program, VICP, was born. Funded by a federal excise tax on each dose of vaccine, the VICP remains a model method for ensuring that all persons harmed by vaccines are compensated quickly and generously while also protecting companies that make life-saving products from abuses of the tort system, end quote. Of the ability of lay juries to award damages for injuries reportedly caused by vaccines, John Enders once cautioned, we must never again allow decisions about essentially scientific matters to be made for us by people without training or insight. Was that prophetic? Simply put, Salk's vaccine worked. From the more than 21,000 paralytic cases reported in 1952, only 2,525 cases were reported in 1960 and 61 cases in 1965. Despite these amazing gains in the United States, Work continued on a rival vaccine technology that was thought to be more effective and cheaper for the rest of the world. Against the backdrop of success of Salk's killed injectable vaccine, let us pick up the parallel thread of a live attenuated oral vaccine, which had been the choice of much of the virological establishment. After all, how could something dead stimulate much of an immune response? In fact, the first polio vaccine to see some kind of success had come not from academia or from a national foundation funded lab, but from a Polish refugee working at a pharmaceutical company. While at Laterly Laboratories, Hilary Kaprowski attenuated type one polio virus by passing it through the brains of American cotton rats. In January, 1948, he and an assistant took the vaccine by mouth without side effects. Two years later, in 1950, Kaprowski tested a type two or Lansing vaccine, first on an eight-year-old boy and then on 19 other children at Letchworth Village, a home in New York state for children with epilepsy and or intellectual disability. He had been invited there by his friend, Dr. George Jervis, the laboratory director, who reasoned that the residents were liable to smear their feces around and thus presented an infectious danger to themselves and to staff. Thankfully, the volunteers were safe and developed antibodies. Even though using institutionalized populations for medical research was still common at the time, the secret trial stirred criticism when he shared it at an NFIP roundtable. For testing a live virus vaccine on children, he thought, presumably, had nothing to lose. On the other hand, if something did go terribly wrong, these are precisely the children with no mental or physical reserve. They actually had the most to lose. Even for the 1950s, and only halfway through the Tuskegee study of untreated syphilis, it was considered unethical by Kaprowski's peers. He tested his vaccine on and off around the world without bringing a final product to market. His boss had also developed a live attenuated vaccine, but both lost out to the other big name in this story. Historian David Ovshinsky wrote, quote, the 1960s would belong to Albert Sabin the way the 1950s had belonged to Salk, end quote. No Johnny come lately, the boy born Abram Saperstein 
in Bialystok and immigrated to the United States in 1921 and became a naturalized citizen in 1930 as Albert Bruce Sabin. Sabin had been researching polio for a lot longer than Salk, but his cautious scientific approach and sharp tongue clashed with the smooth fundraising showmanship of Basil O'Connor. His oral vaccine was attenuated by passage through monkey kidney tissue at sub-physiological temperatures. After confirming the safety of his vaccine on himself, his family, and his colleagues, Sabin did early research on 30 adults at a prison and then effectively eradicated the disease among school children in Cincinnati. With the pall cast by the Cutter incident, Sabin turned to the, to the Soviet Union, where in 1959, his oral polio vaccine was given to 10 million school children. Less of a clinical trial than a public health demonstration, there was no control group. If the domestic politics of Democrat versus Republican provide half of the context of polio vaccine development, the other half is the global tension caused by the Cold War. The monovalent oral oral polio vaccines were initially approved separately and over the objections of the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis, which still supported Salk's injectable vaccine. Until a trivalent vaccine was available, the three monovalent vaccines were dripped onto a sugar cube so that the child only had to open their mouth and swallow once. Like Salk, Sabin declined to patent his vaccine, so while politics delayed its full approval in the United States, the Soviet Union provided it to other countries. And thus, in 10 years, there were two widely used polio vaccines around the world. The cultivation of polio virus in monkey kidney tissue had enabled the production of large quantities for vaccines but 10 to 30% of the doses of polio vaccine given in the United States were contaminated with live simian virus 40. This is a macaque polio omovirus that when injected into baby hamsters causes tumors. When virologist Maurice Hilleman realized this and caused a ripple of concern that between 1955 and 1963, hundreds of millions of children had been injected with or swallowed a vaccine contaminated with a tumorogenic virus. One company stopped making polio vaccine in response. However, 35 years of observation has detected no increase in cancer rates that could be attributed to SV40, and no vaccine in use today contains SV40 virus. In 1967, molecular biologist Joshua Lederberg, who had won the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 1958 for his discovery of bacterial conjugation, penned a series of provocative but ultimately pro-science articles in the Washington Post intended to temper unbridled enthusiasm for polio vaccination. Lederberg praised the protection afforded by the Salk and Sabin vaccines while decrying the fact that there was no federal registry with which to track exposure to contaminants such as simian virus 40. He reminded readers that absence of proof of vaccine caused disease such as leukemia was not the same thing as data proving its safety. Quote, it was the purest good fortune that this was not the worst medical catastrophe in history, end quote. Lederberg argued that everyone should be vaccinated, but not everyone would have come down with the disease naturally. So scientists needed to make sure the side effect rate was as low as possible. To do this, the government needed to fund more basic science research such as in molecular biology, his field 
to create the knowledge and tools with which to assess vaccines. For instance, what happens to live attenuated viruses after they are introduced into the body by a vaccination? What explains viral trophism? Quote, we are in a very poor position to predict what might happen to reawaken a virus's appetite for brain, he admonished. Vaccines are probably the most potent drugs we expose ourselves to, end quote. And the SV40 incident, like the Cutter incident before it, stimulated increased willingness to create and submit to federal safety regulations. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention today, two doses of inactivated polio virus are more than 90% effective against polio disease and three doses are 90 to nine to 100% effective. Fully vaccinated equals four doses of injectable polio vaccine and or trivalent oral polio vaccine with the last dose at at least four years old at least six months after dose number three. Protection is assumed to be on the order of years to decades. Why did the United States switch from injected to oral to injected polio vaccine after three decades? Sabin's oral polio vaccine is an attenuated virus that is cheaper to store and transport, easier to administer without sharps or training, is thought to produce both humoral and mucosal immunity faster, and it protects the community by a shedding of vaccine virus in the stool. It became the standard in the United States from 1967 to 1999. Salk's killed virus vaccine needs cold storage, needles, and trained staff, but it produces equivalent protection against viremia and does not cause vaccine-associated paralytic polio in one to in 2.4 million doses. In the absence of wild-type disease, the public and authorities began to deem the risk from the oral vaccine unacceptable, and by 2000, transition to an all-injected polio vaccine schedule would be complete. In this last section, I want to discuss polio eradication, which was launched in the 1980s on the model of smallpox eradication, which had just been declared in 1980. Among other non-governmental organizations, Rotary International has played a key role through the Global Polio Eradication Initiative. When the GPEI started in 1988, Polio paralyzed more than a thousand children worldwide every day. And since then, more than 2.5 billion children have been immunized against polio, thanks to the cooperation of more than 200 countries and 20 million volunteers. A question, in what two countries does wild type poliomyelitis? continue to circulate? Let's find out. In 1979, the United States experienced the last case of poliomyelitis contracted here. The last case brought by a traveler was in 1993, and the Pan American Health Organization declared polio eliminated from the Americas in 1994. The last case of polio in Europe was in 1998 in a boy in Turkey, and polio was declared eradicated there in 2002. The continent of Africa has been free from wild poliomyelitis since Nigeria confirmed eradication in August of 2020. However, circulating vaccine-derived polio virus, mostly type 2, has broken out in 23 countries thanks to the COVID pandemic, slowing down vaccination efforts. 
Some countries are now using a novel oral polio vaccine against type 2 to try to stamp that out. Wild polio continues to circulate in only two countries in the world. Afghanistan has had three cases of wild type 1 polio in 2021, and Pakistan has had one. Polio is almost eradicated. Like smallpox, it is being conquered not by herd immunity, but by vaccination. Lest you think the eradication of polio is going any smoother outside the United States as in it, anthropologist Miriam Yaya has described the controversy about the Global Polio Eradication Initiative in Northern Nigeria in 2003. I am not a scholar of Africa, but my colleague, Pitt Professor Mary Wabel, helped me understand the time when the Supreme Council for Sharia in Nigeria claimed that the oral polio vaccine was laced with anti-fertility agents and the HIV virus. Was this a simple case of misinformation? Yaya argues, rather than delegitimize these as rumors, these anxieties need to be taken seriously and their root causes addressed if the controversy is to be resolved effectively. An elder in Minjimbir explained, it is as a result of education that we ask questions as to what medicine is being brought into the country, what it contains, and how it will affect us. You see, in the early 2000s, the United States war in Southwest Asia, aka the Middle East, were frequently interpreted as a war on Islam. In an age of total war and bioterrorism, contaminated vaccines were not outside the realm of the imaginable. Furthermore, when traces of estrogens were discovered in vaccine lots, even though these were at sub-physiological levels, it made some people ask what else was not being disclosed about the vaccine contents. It reminded Nigerians of the time in 1996 when Pfizer tested a new antibiotic during a meningitis outbreak without proper consent. So they wonder what these largely white and Western philanthropies want when they devote hundreds of millions of dollars to polio eradication. Like the United States, Nigeria has regional factions and residents of the Muslim North often distrust the Nigerian federal government. The nation's primary care system failed in the 1990s and struggled in the early 2000s with even basic medical supplies. Traditional shamans filled the vacuum for expertise on health and illness. They believe polio is caused by the spirit Shan Inna, who consumes the limbs of people. However, those individuals are not seen as disabled or excluded from the rest of the community. So there isn't the fear of polio as in the United States in the 1950s. Instead, Nigerian parents were more concerned about dehydration, malnutrition, and vaccination against more common diseases, such as measles and malaria. When the GPEI tried to do public education through the radio, they couldn't reach most rural communities who were used to open air education by a known and trusted leader, someone they could ask questions of, unlike with a mass broadcast. For instance, it was unclear how many immunizations a child needed. Was it dangerous for a child to have more than four doses of the oral polio vaccine in cases of mop-up campaigns? And caregivers didn't feel like they could get reliable answers out of the 9 to 14-year-old girls who were hired to go door to door giving the drops. If it was important, why weren't the true professionals administering the vaccine? And finally, the GPEI paid organizers a per diem rate that may have created a perverse incentive to draw out the polio vaccination campaigns 
even as this work took them away from the already skeleton public health and medical infrastructure. So it wasn't merely a case of lack of information. So where are we today? Polio myelitis virus wild types two and three have been declared eradicated and only wild type one still circulates in Afghanistan and Pakistan. GPEI currently hopes to eradicate all wild type polio by 2023. And then it will be a matter of containing vaccine derived poliomyelitis. So that's my answer to Twitter user JTalk. You can in fact get polio from a polio vaccine if it's the oral formulation. That brings up some questions such as, is vaccine associated paralytic polio a bug or a feature? Why did we decide that cost should be the determining factor in vaccinating the developing world instead of safety? How many cases of vaccine associated paralysis are acceptable? If the developing world didn't have the health infrastructure to support injectable polio vaccination, could or should the global north have done something about that? In conclusion, I want to share some practical tips about the Vaccine Adverse Events Reporting System. Healthcare providers who administer COVID-19 vaccines are required by law to report to VAERS the following, vaccine administration errors, whether or not associated with an adverse effect, as well as serious adverse events, regardless of causality, temporary or permanent disability, hospitalization, birth defects, multi-system inflammatory syndrome, serious breakthrough COVID infection leading to hospitalization, life-threatening events such as anaphylaxis, thrombosis, or myocarditis, death, and any other significant happening even if you aren't sure whether vaccination caused it. Less serious events such as shoulder injury and vasovagal syncope should also be reported. Oh, and in case you're worried that the reporting system could be abused, knowingly filing a false VAERS report is a violation of federal law, punishable by fine and imprisonment if it is detected. This is the landing page for the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System. You'll want to click here, Report an Adverse Event. That opens this page. Choose Report Online. I used this form to report a case of Guillain-Barre syndrome in a woman after Pfizer dose number one. And that's it. You will get a number of, that, of the investigation and the results are up to the investigators. They won't make a determination about whether that single case could be attributed to the vaccine, but as always, data in the aggregate are so valuable. I'd like to show you that I have a number of pages of resources that I conducted while I did this secondary research. And so in summary, polio vaccination was not just a Salk and Pittsburgh success story. It has been a group effort distributed across many labs and non-governmental organizations. Polio vaccine development was politicized and fraught with fear-mongering, just as COVID vaccination is today. The Supreme Court has thus far upheld vaccine mandates during outbreaks in 1905 and for school attendance in 1922. If you give vaccinations, you are required by law to report adverse events through the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System. And then finally, the Vaccine Injury Compensation Program exists to compensate inju individuals injured by vaccines without having to resort to case, uh, the, the, the uh, case courts. So finally, questions. <laughs> 
I actually have a list of resources such as books, movies, and podcasts if, that you might enjoy on this topic that I'd be happy to share via email. And this final image is of art at the UPMC Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh, photo by Anna Coronado that the uh, hospital staff and the residents like I was walk by every day to and from the garage, always looking at those local Pittsburgh children, the polio pioneers who helped to get us where we are today. Thank you.